Every few minutes, in Japan, France, or China, a bullet train glides out right on schedule, covering hundreds of miles at twice the speed of America's fastest rail, a technology proven since 1964. But in the United States, true high-speed rail is still missing, not because it could not be built, but because of a unique sequence of policy, culture, and missed decisions. Why did America diverge, and what did we lose along the way? If you care about the future of cities and transport, subscribe now. What comes next reveals that this outcome was never inevitable. On October 1, 1964, the world's first high-speed rail line opened in Japan. The Tokaido Shinkansen, linking Tokyo and Osaka, was designed from the ground up for one purpose moving people, not freight. Its standard gauge track stretched over 300 miles, built entirely new and separate from older, slower lines. From the very first day, trains raced along this corridor at 210 kilometers per hour, about 130 miles per hour, cutting travel time between the two cities from six and a half hours to just four hours. The Shinkansen was not an experimental prototype or a one-off demonstration. It was a fully operational system built to handle the surge of travelers for the Tokyo Olympics and beyond. The project drew on years of planning that reached back before World War II, but it was the post-war drive for modernization and a willingness to invest public money, including an $80 million World Bank loan that pushed it over the finish line. Japanese National Railways managed the build, relying on a workforce that blended engineering tradition with new ambition. Dedicated exclusively to passenger service, the Shinkansen's new alignment allowed for straight tracks, gentle curves, and no level crossings, features that made sustained high speeds not just possible, but reliable and safe. This was not a train running fast just once, but a system built to deliver those speeds every hour, every day. The Shinkansen quickly became the backbone of Japan's transportation network, setting a new global benchmark for what rail could achieve. In 1964, the future of fast, reliable intercity travel was already here, proven, visible, and ready to be copied. International high-speed rail is defined by more than just a fast train. According to the International Union of Railways and the European Union, the standard for new high-speed lines is a minimum of 250 kilometers per hour, roughly 155 miles per hour, sustained in daily service, not just on test runs, but with passengers on board, running on tracks built for that purpose. Upgraded lines where older infrastructure is improved are expected to support about 200 kilometers per hour or 124 miles per hour as a baseline. These thresholds matter because they separate true high-speed rail from conventional trains that might sprint briefly but slow down for curves, crossings, or shared traffic. France put these standards into action in 1981, launching the TGV between Paris and Lyon. The TGV ran at 260 to 270 kilometers per hour from the very start, and its dedicated tracks allowed for consistent high-speed journeys that quickly became the backbone of French intercity travel. Germany, Italy, Spain, and other European countries followed, weaving a dense network of high-speed corridors that now connect cities across the continent and often replace short-haul flights. By the early 21st century, Europe had built thousands of kilometers of true high-speed rail, linking major cities with reliable, frequent service. China entered the arena in the early 2000s, but its pace has been unmatched. By the early 2020s, China had constructed over 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, more than the rest of the world combined. Trains routinely run at 300 to 350 kilometers per hour on fully grade, separated, electrified lines designed exclusively for passenger service. These networks are not isolated showpieces. They form the backbone of everyday travel for millions, reshaping how people move between cities. While definitions can sound technical, they set a clear benchmark. True high-speed rail is about sustained speed, dedicated infrastructure, and a scale that transforms national mobility. 
With this standard in mind, the American approach stands out for what it has and has not built. By the late 20th century, the United States had become a freight powerhouse for moving goods by rail. Long trains carrying coal, grain, and containers cross the continent, supported by a network optimized for heavy, slow cargo rather than fast passenger service. The priorities of major railroads were clear. Freight paid the bills while passenger trains became a burden. As private railroads struggled to keep up with the rise of highways and airlines, they lobbied to shed their passenger operations. In 1970, Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act, creating Amtrak. This new quasi-public company took over inner-city passenger routes starting May 1, 1971, relieving private railroads of their legal obligation to run passenger trains. Amtrak inherited a patchwork of routes, most of them running on tracks still owned and controlled by freight companies. While freight railroads reinvested in their core business and became profitable, Amtrak operated at the margins, dependent on annual federal appropriations and often subject to delays behind priority freight traffic. The result was a system where passenger trains had to fit around the needs of the freight industry, shaping everything from schedules to infrastructure investment and making the idea of dedicated high-speed passenger lines a distant prospect. Federal policy after World War II made a decisive bet on highways and the airline industry, not passenger rail. In 1956, Congress passed the Federal Aid Highway Act launching the interstate highway system with a $25 billion commitment, which is over $200 billion in today's dollars. The Highway Trust Fund, created the same year, guaranteed a steady flow of money for new roads, all paid through fuel taxes earmarked for highway construction and maintenance. This dedicated pipeline insulated road funding from annual political fights and allowed states to plan decades ahead while passenger rail depended on uncertain year-to-year -year appropriations. As suburbs spread outward, highways fueled sprawl, making car ownership and long commutes the norm. Aviation soon followed with its own trust fund and federal support, further connecting cities by air. Meanwhile, railroads faced heavy regulation, property taxes, and even a federal excise tax on tickets until 1962. These policy choices, paired with a culture that equated cars with freedom and prosperity, reshaped travel habits and land use. The result was a feedback loop. More highways led to more sprawl, which in turn drove further demand for roads and airports, sidelining the case for modern passenger rail. Every attempt to build high-speed rail in the United States runs headlong into a maze of procedural and operational barriers. Federal law requires major projects to undergo detailed environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act (NEPA). In practice, this means that every time a project is delayed or reimagined, often with each new administration, the entire process can reset. For California's high-speed rail, this cycle has dragged environmental studies and permitting into a process measured in decades, not years. Even after approval, ownership and dispatch control create a second layer of delay. Amtrak and state agencies may operate the trains, but the tracks themselves are often owned and scheduled by freight railroads. On a typical day, a passenger train might be scheduled to glide through a corridor at 60 miles per hour only to spend half an hour idling behind a slow-moving freight. Dispatchers working for the freight companies hold the real power to decide which train moves first. While federal law, Title 49 of the United States Code Section 24308, gives passenger trains legal priority, enforcement is weak and delays are common. Each of these hurdles, permitting resets and freight dispatch, adds years to planning and precious minutes to every journey, locking American Rail into a cycle of frustration that no amount of funding alone can fix. The promise of high-speed rail in America runs up against the hard limits of 19th century infrastructure. Most existing tracks were laid out to serve steam engines, following property lines, rivers, and the contours of old towns. 
As a result, curves are tight, often with radii far smaller than what modern bullet trains require. On the Northeast Corridor, for example, only about 22 miles allow trains to reach 150 miles per hour, and even those stretches are interrupted by sharp bends and crowded approaches. The rest of the corridor is a patchwork of speed restrictions, some dropping below 30 miles per hour through cities like Bridgeport and Baltimore. Grade crossings add another layer of constraint. In much of Europe and Asia, high-speed lines are completely grade-separated. So cars, buses, and pedestrians never cross the tracks at street level. In the U.S., thousands of grade crossings remain, especially outside major cities. Each one is a hard stop for true high-speed service because a train traveling over 180 miles per hour cannot safely share space with road traffic. Signaling systems also lag behind. While Japan and France use continuous cab signaling and advanced train control to maintain tight headways at high speeds, many American lines still rely on wayside signals and older safety systems. These barriers have nothing to do with the power of the trains themselves. The real ceiling comes from the legacy track geometry, the crossings, and outdated controls, features that cannot be fixed by simply buying faster trains. The infrastructure, silent and unyielding, sets the upper limit for speed. Brightline in Florida has become the most visible example of new intercity passenger rail in the United States. Its trains connect Miami and Orlando at speeds up to 125 miles per hour, running on upgraded tracks that were once the domain of slow-moving freight. Unlike past public efforts, Brightline is privately financed, relying on a mix of private equity, tax-exempt bonds, and revenue from real estate development around its stations. This approach has allowed Brightline to avoid some of the political and funding pitfalls that stalled earlier projects. The company's plans for Brightline West, a line linking Las Vegas and Southern California, aim for speeds up to 186 miles per hour on a fully grade-separated route using electric trains that approach international standards. Elsewhere, pilot projects are exploring hydrogen-powered trains and expanded electrification, especially for corridors where full high-speed lines may not pencil out. These efforts show that progress is possible, but they also highlight the gap between incremental improvements and the kind of national network seen in Japan, France, or China. America's transportation choices still define how millions move, work, and breathe. As cities grow and climate deadlines loom, every delay in building true high-speed rail is a decision with real cost. The future is not waiting for permission. It is shaped by the commitments we make today. Join the conversation below.